reach across time and see yourself. You stand tall against terrifying enemies. You build masterpieces and break down barriers. You rush into the future and meet your past. For every time, at every moment, the official network of every millennium. The History Channel, where the past comes alive. Garbage. It's everywhere, including space. It keeps coming, and now it's toxic. Can our technology sort it, cycle it, and bury it before it buries us? Now, Garbage on Modern Marvel. Garbage is like pornography. It's difficult to define, but you know it when you see it. To some, it's dirty, and to others, it's a living. Luis Pacheco is one of the quarter million Americans who make a living moving garbage from where it is unwanted to where it is wanted. As a society, we value what he does. Luis earns about the same salary as a high school teacher. Make your heart beat a little better. Americans throw away more per capita than any other nation. Over 200 million tons a year. We got a TV here. On average, an American citizen throws away five times more trash than a citizen of India. Well, I guess that's it here. Truck is loaded, so we're going to the landfill. Once Luis fills his truck, he needs to empty it somewhere. In Los Angeles, he's got three options. He can burn it, recycle it, or bury it. The burning of garbage is done at a waste-to-energy plant. Luis will be charged about $35 per ton to drop his load of trash into the giant holding tank at one of LA's two high-tech incinerators. After the largest items have been removed, the unsorted garbage is dropped into a furnace burning at 1,700 degrees. The heat will create steam, which turns turbines to generate electricity. The leftover ash will be sent to a landfill. His second option is to take his truck to a materials recovery facility. Leaving unsorted trash here costs more than an incinerator, between $40 to $50 per ton. Here, trash is sorted by hand. Recyclable materials are separated out for sale to manufacturers, and the rest is sent to a landfill. Luis's third option is to take the load directly to a landfill. That's the least expensive place, as low as $19.50 per ton, and thus the most popular. Let's see how much we got. From the outside entrance, it looks like a park. But inside, Puente Hills is the largest capacity high-tech sanitary landfill in the nation. This facility accepts an average of 12,000 tons a day of material. That's, that's a full 30% of all the waste generated in Los Angeles County. And that 12,000 is what's received for disposal. In addition, there's another two or 3,000 tons per day accepted every day for recycling purposes. The existing mega dumps like Puente Hills are the result of a 1991 Environmental Protection Agency edict that prohibits landfills from polluting the ground, the water, or the air. These facilities are not anything like dumps that we all remember from our childhood. We have displaced and replaced the old municipal dump. Each landfill must now be sealed so that liquid can't flow down into the water supply or percolate up from the groundwater table. This is done by spreading a compacted layer of dense clay and then a layer of thick plastic sheeting about as thick as the sole of a shoe. The plastic is heat sealed and tested to make sure there are no leaks. Then a layer of porous rock with a drainage system that will gather and pump out any toxic liquid or leachate that accumulates at the bottom of the liner. Once the area is sealed, trash can finally be dumped. 
Every day it is compacted and covered with a layer of dirt to prevent odors and reduce the nuisance of flies and rodents. Underground, the organic material slowly decomposes in an anaerobic or oxygen-less environment, producing methane, a highly flammable gas. To prevent the explosive buildup of methane, perforated pipes are laid every 60 feet to extract the gas and vent it to the surface. From there, it is piped directly to an electrical generating plant on the landfill property. The plant at Puente Hills currently generates about 50 megawatts of electricity, enough to power 100,000 homes. Using garbage gases to power a city is part of the current trend to make trash more of an asset than a burden. But for much of history, garbage wasn't thought of as a burden. It was simply a fact of life. People have been discarding things ever since Eve tossed away the first apple core. For most of history, littering was the disposal method of choice. People just dropped their garbage wherever it was created and moved on. Then about 10,000 years ago, people began settling in one place and piling their trash nearby. What remains today are the piles of seashells left by coastal fishing tribes. But garbage didn't really become a nuisance until people began living in cities. What was politically necessary to do was done. That is, in the slums of Rome, or in lower class neighborhoods, or where slave quarters were located, not much attention was given to keeping those areas clean. But to major thoroughfares that had commercial value, or were important to the emperor, uh, or were areas where a lot of people were going to congregate on a, a regular basis, then attention was given to keeping those areas clean. Outside of the ancient city of Rome, archaeologists have found garbage dumps where the normal rubbish of the city appears mixed with the bones of animals and humans, possibly slain victims of the bloody fights in the Colosseum. Other ancient cities had their own methods of city sanitation. In ancient uh, Palestine, for example, the streets were flushed daily. Uh, because Mosaic Law demanded that level of cleanliness. In China, city inspectors picked up and disposed of the bodies of dead animals and citizens lying by the side of the road. This was done for aesthetic rather than health reasons. During the Middle Ages, a series of plagues devastated Europe, killing between a quarter and a half of the population. Garbage played a major role since the disease was spread by the fleas on the rats that wallowed in the city waste. We really did not understand what caused disease. We assumed it was God's will. You know, that uh, if you were bad, if you were evil, you were struck down. If you weren't, you survived. In the Middle Ages in Edinburgh, or even in Paris or other parts of Europe, uh, what was typical in a residential community is once you were done with the chamber pot, or once you were done with uh, your fixing your meal, open the window, throw it out. This casual disposal of waste attracted scavenging animals, which roamed the streets of many early American cities. Pigs and sometimes turkeys just were roaming the streets and collecting the garbage that was thrown out. So they became what I call you know, kind of biological vacuum cleaners. Going back to colonial uh, New Amsterdam, uh, city, city authorities attempted to stop domestic livestock from running through the streets and uh, knocking people over. They could also uh, disrupt the pavement uh, and move cobblestones around, so there were all sorts of ordinances passed. But there was a benefit to having pigs and uh, dogs in the streets, and so even though it was illegal, it was not uncommon. In the mid-1800s, the streets of New York were several feet deep in garbage and horse manure. One visitor had this observation. The feast of fat things that come reeking under one's nose at each special puddle of festering filth that Center Street provided and its reeking, fermenting, putrefying, pestilential gutter. I thought I should have died of the stink rage and headache before I got to 21st Street. In England around 1840, attorney Edwin Chadwick conducted a study on why the poor remained poor. His conclusion was groundbreaking. There was a correlation between poverty and disease. And he saw as the intermediary in all this filth and waste. And that led to what is known as the sanitary idea, the notion that if you have a mound of waste, 
in the middle of your city, what's going to improve health conditions is to take it out of there, to move it from there to someplace else where it may not cause so much trouble. The conviction that waste and disease were closely linked spread quickly through Europe and America. By 1850, American doctors and health workers were starting cleanup campaigns. They enlisted volunteers to clean out their homes, sweep the streets, and carry the rubbish away to rid their towns of the odiferous mess that was spreading what they believed to be deadly fumes. But it was fundamentally wrong. From a scientific point of view, disease was not caused by smells, by miasmas, by sewer gas. It was caused by bacteria. And so, in reality, this is a flawed idea, but in practice, it did have a salutary effect. So, based on this flawed concept that filth alone causes disease, health workers set about to change the behaviors and attitudes of American city dwellers. From street cleanups to anti-litter campaigns, America's relationship to garbage would never be the same. New York is a city of superlatives, and when it comes to garbage, the Big Apple tops every American metropolis. With over 24,000 people per square mile, trash piles up so quickly that in some areas of the city, garbage is collected seven times a week. Special events and holidays provide an additional challenge to the city's sanitation crew. A ticker tape parade for the New York Yankees after their 1998 World Series win left 44 tons of paper. But whether it's parade litter or dinner scraps, New York's garbage is collected by a trained and organized crew with equipment designed specifically for the job, a job that came into being barely 100 years ago. As American cities began to grow in the mid-1800s, most city governments had inadequate plans for the disposal of garbage. Rag pickers served as the city recyclers. Garbage collected by city workers was often dumped into the rivers and oceans. Inevitably, it washed back into shore, clogging the harbors and ruining the beaches. Then in 1896, a New York sanitation director was appointed who would revolutionize garbage collection, Colonel George Waring. He fought in the Civil War and actually was a, a battlefield commander. He had a handlebar mustache and he wore a pith helmet and wore riding boots all the time and had this military bearing about him. So what he, what he does is develop a very elaborate kind of public relations campaign in New York. Uh, he puts all of his uh, street cleaners in white uniforms, talk about impractical, you know, here they are in all this dirt and muck and everything, but the idea was to associate them with cleanliness, with doctors and other professions that wore white, and he called them his white wings, and he paraded them down the streets of New York in annual parades, marching very proudly. Waring paid his workers a dollar a day, a fair wage at the time, and began turning the sanitation department into a revenue producer by initiating the first municipal recycling program. Each household had three barrels, one for ash, one for garbage, and one for, for rubbish. Garbage was sent to a rendering plant on Barren Island where it was steamed and then squeezed in giant presses. Oils and grease would be separated off and was actually sold uh, to industrial manufacturers as for lubricants. And the remaining material uh, was dried and then later it was turned into uh, cakes of, of fertilizer, dried into fertilizer, and sold uh, to farmers all across the United States. In 1896, 80% of New York's household waste was ash from wood and coal. Waring had that hauled by barge to a growing landfill called Rikers Island now home to a federal penitentiary. Waring's recycling plan had another positive impact on the city of New York. Very little garbage was left over to dump into the ocean until after World War I. In 1918, the waste recycling market collapsed. Changes in industrial production uh, meant that many recycled products were no longer profitable to produce. So beginning in 1918, 1919, New York City had to again dump into the ocean. A lawsuit against New York's dumping practices filed by the garbage-plagued communities on the New Jersey shore finally worked its way to the Supreme Court, which in 1934 outlawed the dumping of all municipal waste into the ocean. Ocean dumping wasn't the only disposal system to fall from grace. Another we imported from the British. In England, they had a hard time dumping it at sea since they depended upon the sea 
uh, for their livelihood and also because they had neighbors in close proximity along the English Channel and the North Sea. So this uh, necessity being the mother of invention led the English to develop incinerators. British incinerators or destructors were designed to burn rubbish using very little fuel and many converted the heat into electricity. This energy efficient technology appealed to Americans and between 1880 and 1900 an incinerator building boom produced 180 of them around the country. But the noxious smoke angered local residents and in the end the English technology couldn't make the transition to American soil. The water content of our garbage tended to be higher. We had more organic materials that made their way into the waste stream. And therefore, these, these kind of low energy burners didn't operate very efficiently in the United States. By 1909, over 100 incinerators were shut down. Another option available to American cities was the landfill. But landfills were unpleasant and dangerous. They smelled, they were breeding grounds for flies and rats, and without warning, they would spontaneously burst into flame. It would take World War II to produce the modern landfill. Wartime is a time of shortage. And the campaign, Get Some Cash for Your Trash, had people saving and recycling like never before. One old radiator will provide scrap metal for 17 rifles. One old shovel will help make four hand grenades. In World War II, we were masters at collecting stuff. Tires, you were allowed four tires and one spare. If you had more than that and were caught, you were sent to jail. So everybody turned in their extra tires so we'd have the rubber. And there were newspaper drives, and there were can drives, and there were tinfoil drives, and there were all these other things. Recycling campaigns were so successful that they overwhelmed many agencies' ability to collect the items. By 1942, citizens were even asked to stop saving newspaper because it was becoming such a storage problem. Very little was ever done with that stuff. It was more for public morale. It was more to give the public a sense of participation in the war. And huge quantities of this stuff were dumped after the war. During the war, army units disposed of their garbage by digging a hole and covering each day's trash with a layer of dirt. This method became known as the sanitary landfill and was quickly adopted by civilians after the war as they entered an era of unprecedented consumerism. All made possible with lightweight, heat-conducting aluminum containers. With the war over, optimism and affluence prompted the smoldering spark of consumerism to once again catch fire, and Madison Avenue was ready to fan the flames. And complete dinners, which only need heating and are ready to serve. Between 1958 and 1976, packaging consumption alone, 63%. And you can really taste the difference because the polyethylene lining of Miraglaze cups is absolutely tasteless. While Americans enjoyed their new and improved lives, made better through chemically created synthetic materials, new and more toxic waste was gradually seeping into the soil, the water, and the air. March 1987, a barge called the Mobro 4000, loaded with 3,000 tons of baled New York rubbish, head south looking for a landfill to accept the trash. Over the next two months, the barges refused dumping rights in six U.S. states and three Caribbean countries. Mexico wouldn't even let us into their water, so you know it's got to be bad. Finally, the barge returns to New York, its cargo intact. After a prolonged wait, the owners of the barge are finally allowed to burn the garbage in a Brooklyn incinerator but the image of the wandering barge is now imprinted into the minds of millions. And it seems to signal a crisis over where to put our garbage. I don't think that's a bad image for Americans to have gotten, and I'm glad that, that it impacted that way so that we're concerned about it. But the truth of the Mobro 4000 is totally different. There were these guys in Long Island that said, hey, they're paying 
$110, $120 a ton to get rid of it. We'll take 3,000 tons, put it on a barge, float it down to South Carolina, offload it for $11 a ton, and make a fortune in 10 days. Well, what happened was some media guy got on to him, called South Carolina, called some politicians there, and they came out and said, not in my state you don't. Even though the landfill guy right behind him would say, please let him in. You know, that $11 a ton, that's 3,000 tons, that's a lot of money, let him in. But no, it was no one's gonna take New York's garbage. Today, New York exports a portion of its garbage to Virginia and Pennsylvania, but most of it still goes to the same place it's been going for the last 50 years. Rubbish from the five boroughs of New York is picked up by city dump trucks and taken to a transfer station where it is unloaded onto floating barges. Every day, over 13,000 tons of garbage come through here. Once the barge is loaded with its 620 tons of trash, it is towed across the harbor to Staten Island, where it is unloaded into a landfill that by area is the largest in America. This is the Fresh Kills Landfill. In 1948, this was coastal marshland. Today it is a mountain of compacted garbage, over 160 feet high, stretching out over five square miles. It is scheduled to close soon because it will begin to obstruct local air traffic if it gets much higher. But for now, it remains open, the only local refuge for New York's refuse. Landfills like Fresh Kills are not only good places for trash, they have also become places to study. These are archaeology students from the University of Arizona dig in landfills for clues about the way people live their lives. They are led on these digs by archaeologist Bill Rathje. It'd be nice if we could get a good date right off. Coupon void after October 13th, 1963. I think you did a good job there. I just realized that the best way for students to understand archaeology is to do it using garbage just like archaeologists do in traditional society. Rathji's students catalog all the items, dating their finds by magazines and newspapers buried with the trash. Decomposition is slow in landfills, so many food items are very well preserved. This has led to surprising discoveries, such as the extreme waste of beef in 1973, the year of a severe beef shortage. Beef was hard to find and it was very expensive. And what happened was people went out and when they could find it, they bought a lot and they bought often cuts they weren't used to. And the result was they wasted three times more beef during the shortage than they have since. Rathji's discoveries have poked holes in other commonly held notions about the way we live. Computers were going to make us a paperless society. And what we found in landfills like this is that they really just generated a lot more hard copy. Paper has, in fact, been the largest single commodity in landfills in the last 20 years. And it is also the fastest growing item going to landfills, despite the fact that in terms of recycling, it is the most recycled. Bill Rathje's scholarly attention to the mundane subject of garbage is part of a broader effort to monitor what is put in the ground. Americans weren't always as careful as they are now about pollution. After World War II, American industry began using new chemical processes and dumping waste products with little governmental regulation. Gradually, people became aware of the poisons that were choking the cities and polluting the planet. Then in 1962, author Rachel Carson wrote a book that shook the nation. In it, she predicted that pesticides and chemical pollution would soon kill off all the songbirds and that future springtimes would no longer be blessed with their singing. The book was called Silent Spring. And while the scientist attacked her thesis, it had an enormous impact on the American people. 
If you couple that with the advent of color television in the middle 60s where a, a yellow outfall flowing into a blue river is a lot more uh, effective in, in, in color than it is in black and white, the spaceship going up to the moon and the receding earth gave us a sense of the earth and its limits. All of these things sort of accumulated in, and in the late 60s exploded into demands by the public that the government step in and do something significant about pollution. Earth Day, April 20th, 1970, marked the rise in public concern over environmental issues, and in that same year, the Environmental Protection Agency was formed. Public demand caused the creation of EPA, and a lot of it was done under President Nixon. I mean, I served in EPA under President Nixon and President Reagan, neither one of whom were exactly charter members of the Sierra Club, and yet both of them felt very strongly that we needed to do something about the environment because they were being pushed hard by the American public. With the establishment of the EPA, disposal of all forms of waste became part of a whole environmental movement. And with it came a growing interest in recycling for ecological rather than economic reasons. These cans will be melted down to make new cans. We call this recycling the aluminum. At the same time, great energy and resource was dedicated to finding technical solutions to the wasteful practices of the past. Abandoned technologies like waste to energy plants that burn garbage and convert it to electricity were reintroduced with great fanfare. A new technology has been developed to recycle energy and raw materials from garbage. In this way, more than 90% of America's refuse can be reused. And from garbage can come newsprint, aluminum, glass, steel, and energy for heat and light. Some plants sorted the garbage before they burned it. Others chopped it up before they sorted it. Still others mixed it all up in a vat, then pulled out the metal and glass and turned the rest into burnable pellets. It all worked in the 1970s and 80s when oil prices were high. But when the price of oil dropped in the mid-1990s, the same plants needed hefty government subsidies to compete in the energy market. As long as cheap energy was available, it still made more sense to put garbage in a landfill. Well, I don't think we're going to get rid of landfills anytime soon, and the reason for that is quite simple. If you recycle, you generate waste. If you burn or incinerate, you generate waste, the ashes. No matter what you do, you're going to generate waste that aren't going to go away under current technologies. They're going to be landfilled. Most Americans can identify this picture. It's the detonation of a nuclear bomb. Fewer Americans can identify this image. It's the disposal of radioactive waste from the manufacture of the nuclear bomb. Thousands of barrels of it dropped into the ocean. Nuclear power is an extraordinary invention. Um, some of the best minds um, of all time uh, discovered nuclear fission and discovered how to harness it. The problem is that the people who were responsible for the waste products of this extraordinary technology were not necessarily the Nobel Prize winners. An upsurge in nuclear power is now underway. By the year 2000, it is expected that about half the total electricity in the United States will be nuclear. The harnessing of nuclear energy elicited irrepressible optimism among U.S. policymakers in the 50s and 60s. Nuclear power promised to do virtually everything. It would supply our electricity, turn salt water into fresh, power our airplanes and spaceships, even do heavy construction work. Nuclear explosives may be the most efficient way to excavate a sea level canal safely, quickly, and for less cost than conventional means. And so we went forward with the technology without having figured out a way to deal with the waste, and the wastes are exquisitely toxic. Radioactive waste is categorized as high level or low level. High level waste is extremely radioactive and often generates very high temperatures. It can be lethal after a brief unprotected exposure and remains dangerously radioactive for hundreds, thousands, and in certain cases, hundreds of thousands of years. 
It includes used fuel rods from nuclear reactors and certain waste from the production of nuclear weapons. Low-level waste contains the same radioisotopes as high-level waste, but in a more diluted form. Most of it is dealt with by dumping in unlined shallow earthen trenches or temporarily storing it in above-ground monitored facilities. When a contaminated item is too large to bury or put into barrels like a nuclear reactor or power plant, the item is either cut up and sent for disposal or covered with concrete or stainless steel and kept in place. This is the government-run U.S. Hanford Reservation at Richland, Washington, a former nuclear weapons manufacturing site next to the Columbia River. Hanford is probably the most radioactive place in the United States. Uh, we are spending extraordinary sums of money to try to stabilize it, and a major portion of that area is going to be a national sacrifice area uh, for as far as we can see into the future. 55 million gallons of high and low-level radioactive chemical waste were generated in the production of nuclear weapons at Hanford. It was stored in underground tanks made of a single shell of carbon steel, which began leaking just 10 years after being filled. Traces of radioactive tritium can now be detected in the groundwater. Cleanup of Hanford calls for a sophisticated technology, and about one quarter of the yearly budget of the Department of Energy. Waste from the leaking tanks is being pumped across the site to a more secure storage area Contaminated soil is being excavated, treated, and consolidated. And crumbling fuel rods and other highly radioactive elements are being sealed into stainless steel barrels, placed in enormous sealed columns, and stored underground where they can be constantly monitored. But this is still considered to be temporary storage. Nuclear waste at the nation's 110 nuclear power plants is also in limbo. Highly toxic spent fuel rods are simply being stored in holding tanks at each plant because no facility will accept them. As the waste grows, the superheated rods are packed closer and closer together. The Department of Energy was given the responsibility for creating a long-term storage facility for high-level nuclear waste and for taking possession of all the spent fuel rods from the nation's nuclear power plants by 1998. That year has come and gone, and the fuel rods are still piling up at the individual power plants. The DOE has proposed the selection of Yucca Mountain in Nevada as the eventual permanent storage facility, but estimates are that it may not be ready until the year 2030, if ever. Some of the components of radioactive waste are extraordinarily long-lived. Let me give one example, plutonium-239. It is dangerous for roughly half a million years. Who's going to watch radioactive waste for 500,000 years? The Department of Energy, in fact, at one point tried to hire some archaeologists and linguists to figure out how to put up warning signs for radioactive waste facilities. And the fundamental question that they had was, since the wastes are so long lived, what language do you write the sign in? Most of us can't even read Old English, which is just a few hundred years old. The language has changed so much. So what language do you write the warning sign in for people to read 10,000 years from now, 100,000 years from now, a million years from now? The challenge of detoxifying thousands of contaminated sites and the eventual management of this long-lived waste now falls on the Department of Energy. In 1993, the department initiated a policy of public openness, releasing formerly classified information and photographs in the belief that citizen awareness of the problem is critical for a workable, long-range solution. Sometimes the public wants answers that don't exist. They they want to be assured that a particular kind of waste, nuclear waste is an example, uh, can be forever taken care of. Well, we don't have a technology that will forever detoxify nuclear waste. It is possible to store it above ground on a secure area, and as long as it's monitored, uh, it shouldn't hurt anybody. It appears that our nuclear waste will require constant monitoring, continued vigilance, endless babysitting. It can never be trusted, never be left alone. It's a far cry from the heady days of the 60s, when one idea being tossed around was that we simply launch our nuclear waste into outer space. 
that idea was quickly abandoned as too dangerous and too expensive. But it doesn't mean that space is litter-free. There is trash in space that's causing serious trouble for the space program. It's known as orbital debris, and at NASA's Johnson Space Center, there are 25 people dedicated to tracking it. Scientists at Johnson systematically monitor and catalog pieces of space junk. Based on this information, rocket launches will be scheduled to avoid hitting any of the 9,000 pieces of orbiting metal that range from 10 centimeters to the size of an abandoned rocket. What you're seeing here is a computer animation of the 9,000 objects that are tracked by the Department of Defense. You're starting out fairly far away, looking down over the North Pole. This concentration through here is the uh, geosynchronous belt. That's the altitude where the time it takes the object to go around its orbit is 24 hours. So it's in sync with the Earth. And then as you get lower into the low altitude stuff, this is where currently the, the largest concentration of debris is. The potential for creating a lot of debris comes from the big payloads and rocket bodies that are up there. The upper stage of a rocket is typically left in orbit. Residual fuel has been left in those rocket bodies. And as time goes on and you go through the Earth's shadow back into sun, there's thermal stress on the rocket. You'll mix the, the fuel with the oxidizer and you have an instant explosion. Rockets can usually avoid the tracked objects. It's the smaller, untrackable debris that is causing most of the damage. We look at, at sizes that can seriously damage a space shuttle or a space station. And those sizes, we're looking at about a centimeter in diameter and larger. That's about the size that we're talking about. That size could uh, puncture the, the pressurized vessel in the space station, for instance. NASA put into orbit pairs of spheres of two, four, and six centimeters to calibrate their telescopes. These spheres are traveling at the same rate as orbital debris, about seven kilometers a second. At that speed, a one centimeter piece of metal has the same energy as a small automobile traveling at 60 miles per hour. What we're showing here is an example of a, a test shot that was actually shot with a hypervelocity gun that, uh, that NASA operates. This was a, a one centimeter sphere that was uh, shot at seven kilometers per second. And this is an example of the kind of damage that the, this can do. This is a, an aluminum block about an inch and a half thick. It's a hypervelocity impact, so there's actually a shock wave that travels through the material. And the energy actually partially melts the aluminum here, and you'll actually blow out the backside. With several million small pieces of metal circling the Earth in every imaginable orbit, space shuttle damage has become common. We have to replace the windshields about every, either every flight or every other flight because there's been a, an impact that is deep enough that although there's no danger during landing, the, the, the launch stresses are, are such that uh, you want to replace that window before you launch it again. Because of the likelihood that some form of space debris will hit an orbiting object, cumbersome bulletproof skins must now be considered for every satellite, shuttle, and space station launched. Cleaning it up is a, is a very difficult uh, proposition. You can't hit it with anything because if you hit it with something, you'll just break it up and you'll have a bunch of smaller pieces which is going to make your problem worse. The only thing you can do is rendezvous with it and, and bring it back and that's a very energy inefficient uh, way to do do that sort of thing. So what, what we try to do is educate uh, satellite launchers about the problems so that they will design their missions in the future to re-enter their payloads and their rocket bodies uh, at the end of their useful life. Some people are taking a political stand on garbage and living a lifestyle that consciously excludes polluting technologies and wasteful behaviors. One of these activists is actor and ecologist Ed Begley, Jr. I grew up in Los Angeles, and I remember vividly the horrible smog. That got me interested 
in environmental matters in general. The smog in the 50s and 60s was very bad here. We used to incinerate our trash in our backyards. That was our way of dealing with it. That was part of the problem why the air was so bad. The city is Los Angeles. The blue-black haze of smog covered the horizon with a skin so thick, visibility was only one half mile. Transit police wore gas masks to protect them from the air. It was September 1955. Ed still lives in Los Angeles and is determined to be part of the solution to LA's pollution problems. His home is powered completely by solar panels, which produce enough energy to light his home, run his computers and appliances, and to power his electric car. He grows his own vegetables, cooks in a solar oven, and produces so little garbage that a typical week's trash can fit in a shoebox. Still, Ed feels that these regimens don't have to take time out of his busy schedule. I'm a die-hard recycler. For me, it is so automatic now. I have to, it's just Pavlovian. I get the mail and it goes here and I'm talking on the phone or I'm on the computer clicking and pointing and cutting and pasting, whatever I'm doing, and the stuff just goes in there. It seems to be out of my control because I've been doing it since 1970. You will see under my desk. Can I hold these up as a photo sure. opportunity? You have white paper still, color paper. I'm gonna lift up some more. We've got chip cardboard, which is, you know, this kind of thing, like, you know, FedEx cardboard, light cardboard, things like that. You have that kind of cardboard. And then you have junk mail, which is, you know, you're like coated papers, things like this, glossy material that's low grade kind of material. That is recyclable, they make a roofing material out of that. And uh, here's the last lonely little can. This is the trash can. And this doesn't have anything in it because we've been recycling everything. Ed's recycling and reusing of his household waste means he sends very little to the landfill. We had 80 people here New Year's Day, a party of 80 people. And the trash from that event was literally uh, a, like a beach ball for 80 people. All the rest was recycled, you know, and I would have liked it to be less than that, but that was as good as I could do with 80 people, and that's not bad. The 1990s has seen a surge of interest in recycling. Like Colonel George Waring in the 1890s, city officials are now actively encouraging recycling to conform to state mandates and to raise revenue. I am optimistic that we will be able to uh, meet most of the state's recycling goals somewhere between the range of 35 and 50 percent of materials that formerly went to landfills. However, the obstacles we face are principally economic ones. Uh, we're, we're more successful at diverting materials than we are in feeding them back into the manufacturing and industrial processes. The problem with recycling has always been what to do with the materials once they've been collected. But today, reusing materials has become increasingly attractive to business, both from a public relations standpoint and because new technologies are finally making it profitable. Technologies like those used at Arcanol Research in California are turning organic matter into sugars, which can be turned into ethanol for use as fuel and into citric acid and other industrial chemicals that might eventually replace the products manufactured from petrochemicals. At Collins and Aikman Floor Covering in Georgia, old carpets, which used to be taking up landfill space, are now ground up and reused for flooring material, or mixed with plastic polymers to form parking lot stops. Plastic, the former bane of landfills and ecologists, is now being reused and reformed into thousands of new products, from gym bags and thermal clothing to construction materials and outdoor furniture. We've always had an uneasy relationship with the things we throw away. Our waste is a constant reminder of the imperfections in our technology, the limits to what we can solve. And yet it is also a challenge, an ongoing opportunity to solve the problems created by our latest excesses. Will today's solutions create tomorrow's debris? Probably. That's what makes us human. We never stop creating garbage, nor do we stop looking for ways to turn it into something else.